Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing today? All right. My name is Mike Famel, and I produce the show In the Shadow of Big Red Eye. We have a tent right over there with some merchandise and stuff. You can learn about our show. We go across the country looking for Bigfoot. I speak uh, after my friend here, Jim, at 1. So if you guys want to stick around for my presentation, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I started off yesterday telling an interesting Bigfoot story. You want to hear another interesting Bigfoot story? All right, is anybody familiar with the Bridges property in Florida? It's the one where Bobo from Finding Bigfoot fell down the stairs. Anyways, they have a property down there that has been having uh, ongoing Bigfoot activity for like 25 years since they built the house. The, uh, when they were building the house, the roofers, actually they were Hispanic uh, origin and they did not speak any English and they, they came up to the, the, the people that were building the house, the bridges, uh, after they were done building the roof and they said, man, we'd really like your pet monkey. It's really cool because they saw a monkey man running around outside the house and they thought it was their pet. So after that, they've had uh, ongoing activity. Like I said, they had, have had uh, little birds, little sparrows that have been defeathered and thrown across into their yards, which is really interesting. They've had, uh, there was one encounter of Mr. Bridges was going out one, uh, one, one morning and he came across a diamondback rattlesnake, right? So he killed the thing and he chucked it over the fence because he didn't want it around his property. And then the next morning, it was, he came, went out back for the newspaper again and it was straight across, the same snake was straight across his, his uh, walkway, pointed right at the door. So that's kind of strange, right? So he was like, screw this, I'm gonna chop this thing up and bury it. Because he didn't want that, the, the Bigfoot to keep messing with him. So he chops the snake up in a bunch of different pieces and buries the thing. The next morning, he goes out to get his paper again, and the snake is in a coiled position, right at, facing right at his door. So if that's that's person, I don't know what that is. But anyway, so the coolest story from, from their property is uh, they both sleep with a CPAP machine, which is very loud. Uh, at night, they heard uh, they were both awoken to something jumping on their roof. It was winter in Florida, so they had their windows open, and it was a, a moonlit night, so you could see all the shadows and stuff coming through their window. They heard they awoke to something jumping on their roof, and you could hear footsteps slowly creeping down the roof right towards above their window. Miss Bridges finally, she's like, this is it. She got her gun from her side table. She's like, this is going to be the day. So the thing keeps creeping down and down and down closer to the window, and it finally you see the head come down towards the window, and it's not a Bigfoot. It's an endangered Florida panther. There's only 25 of them left in the world. So that's pretty cool. That's, that's just a little bit about Bigfooting. Uh, again, introducing guest speaker Jim Boardwine from Southern Virginia. Jim has always been interested in the Bigfoot phenomenon since he was a youngin. He had his own experiences when he was 13 years old, and he researched stories in the Appalachian Mountains ever since. In 2002, he started speaking at different festivals about his first book on Bigfoot encounters in the area. His family has been in the mountains of Virginia since the 1760s, and they have stories going back hundreds of years about the creature being there. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jim Boardwine. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Appreciate y'all coming out today. Now, as my buddy here said, I'm from Virginia. In case y'all can't tell by the way I talk, I ain't from around here. But uh, this is really the way I talk. I've had people say, is that is that really you? Yeah, this is me. I ain't putting on no wires for anybody or nothing. But um, before we get started, we got any veterans in the crowd? You are. Thank you. Thank y'all very much for, for, for serving. We appreciate you. Is, it, is there any law enforcement or ex-law enforcement out there? Okay, good. I guess I can hang around for a few minutes then. Now, like, like my buddy, buddy there said, I, Bigfoot phenomena was something I was always interested in growing up. You know, you hear the stories they, back in the early 70s, they was making some movies and stuff. And of course, I read about Roger Patterson and the Bigfoot movie he made in California in the late 60s. I was always fascinated by it. Well, I finally had my experience and when I was 13 years old in 1976, like I say the family where, where I live at, my family's been on that property since the 1760s. Uh, we, we come over here, branches of my family have been over here since the 1600s, but we've been in that area since the 1760s. And um, we own from the road to the top of the mountain behind us. Now, one day out there, it was in the fall of the year, a friend of mine had come over from school and spent the weekend with me. And we was out in the backyard playing. I, we might have been throwing rocks at each other or something, I don't know. But we looked up on the, in the pasture up in the, toward the mountain there, and my, I had a horse at the time. She was acting real skittish. Well, I'd never seen her act like that before. Now, I knew how she acted when a bear come through, but this, this was completely different. So I said, I said, let's walk up there and check her and make sure she's okay. 
So we walked over his old house where my great granddaddy built. She was standing next to it, and she'd look up toward the mountain, and she'd whirl around and take off, and just really carrying on. So we got up there, and I got to petting her, check her, make sure she hadn't got snake bit or something. I didn't know what was going on, and got her calmed down. I said, "Let's walk up here and look around, see if we can see something." Well, between the cabin and the woodshed, there is a metal pipe coming out of the ground that carried water down out of the mountain to the house. It stopped outside. I guess they run out of pipe before they got to the house with it. But something had ripped that pipe up out of the ground, and there was a partial track there. Well, I, even at 13, I was a pretty good tracker, and I, but I couldn't recognize the track. And so me and my buddy tried to push the pipe back down to where it went, and we, we couldn't do it. You know, I was a pretty good-sized child, and we, we couldn't push the pipe all the way down to where it went. Well, I got to casting about for sign, and I could see where whatever this was it went around the woodshed back up into the mountain. So we uh, we walked up. I said, let's go up here and see if we can see what this is. I didn't know it was a bear or what. Like I say, it just didn't, didn't, nothing added up. So we uh, went around the building and crawled through the barbed wire fence. And I started up into the woods. And the first thing I noticed, I had a, a big male German shepherd. He'd been raised with me. He was seven years old at the time. He protected me against everything. Well, he wouldn't come through the fence. He walked back and forth on the other side of the fence whining. He wouldn't come through the fence. And I thought, well, Man, I've never seen him act like that. I said, Prince, what's the matter with you? Well, when I'm staring looking at my dog, all of a sudden I feel the hair on my back raise up. I know something's staring at me. And I turn around real slow and bounce far from here to Will's car there. There's, there he is. He's standing under him, hemlock tree just looking at me. He didn't make no moves. He didn't make any sound. You know, didn't make no threat to moves or anything. And I don't remember smelling. You know, a lot of times people get a real rank smell off these critters. I don't remember smelling anything. I just remember seeing this thing and... I think my heart stopped. And uh, we looked at each other for a few seconds. I took off. I headed for home. I tell you what, brother, Jesse, uh, uh, Jesse Marcel, what's that? Who was that guy back during World War II, the speed runner? Was it Jesse Marcel? Anyway, this guy, the world champion runner, couldn't have caught me going off the mountain that day. I may have run through the barbed wire fence. I don't remember crawling through it. But I went running down to the house, and my granddaddy was sitting on the front porch of his house. And I was a squall, and he said, boy, what's the matter with you? I said, I just seen something up on the mountain. Don't know what it is. I'm going to get my deer rifle go back up there. He said, boy, you sit down. You ain't going nowhere. And I think about that years later. I think my granddad knew that thing was up there because he had been on the property since he was born. He was born in 1911. He had run them mountains all his life. I really think that he knew about that thing. But, you know, back in those days, back home, if you saw something like that, nobody talked about it because they'd think he's crazy and stick you in a nut house. So nobody would talk about it. It's just getting where here the last few years when I started researching my book that I can get people to come out and tell me their stories. And I'm, I'm just amazed at how many encounters I have documented right there within just a few miles of where I live because people are finally opening up about it. Well, I've never seen him again, but I've heard him. I've heard him howling. I've heard him around my house. Um, in fact, this is a weird story, but the day that my book came off the press, it was delivered to me. That morning at six o'clock, something knocks 12 feet up on my house, two times knocked real hard on the side of my house, 12 feet off the ground. And um, that, that was surprising to say the least. And uh, of course I looked out, he was gone by then. But I've got some friends that are shaman in their respective tribes. One's Cherokee, one's Apache, and one's a Blackfoot. And I've told them what was going on, and they, they talked over amongst themselves, and they say they think that this creature or its family, whatever, has been on that land since way back yonder, since we've been there. And it's kind of considered itself a protector of our family and our land there. And that's a real comfort and thought, you know, because uh, believe me, when I was 13 years old, it scared me. I ain't going to lie about it. Looking back, I know it wasn't going to hurt me. I realized it just it was curious as I was, you know. But, uh, and I'd love to see it again. I've heard it, like I say, I've heard it one morning I was going out real early to take care of some family business I'm not gonna talk about in public, but it howled up on the ridge. Now I know I've run the woods all my life. I know every animal in them woods around there. This was something I'd never heard before. If y'all was here for the Bigfoot calling uh, contest yesterday, you, I heard one or two that made the hair on my back raise up because it sounds so much like it. Now, as far as that goes, I, like I said, I've not seen it again. But last winter, my son had come out there after work one night to see me after he got off work. And before he left, he went out to the woodshed to bring me some wood in for the fireplace. 
he come back in the house and he had a kind of funny look on his face. I said, what's the matter, buddy? He said, I just seen something out in the backyard. I said, what'd you see? He said, I don't know. He said, but it was very tall and it was on two legs. And when the light off my flashlight hit it, it jumped about 20 feet and landed in the creek bed and took off up through the pasture in the mountains again to where I seen it at. I said, well, I've told you it's still around. And then a few nights later, him and a friend from work come by again to see me after work. And uh, once again, before they left, they went out to the woodshed to get me some firewood, you know, because we had a pretty cold winter. And they came back in. The young man with my son said, Mr. Borderline, I don't know what in the world's on your property. But if the moon was shining bright that night, he saw something. He said it looked like it was eight or nine feet tall walking through my pasture in the moonlight. Now, folks, I know everybody where I live. That's like I said what I seen when I was 13. I won't swear that it's Bigfoot, but I don't know anybody around home where I live is covered with dark hair from head to toe. And I don't know anybody that's eight or nine feet tall running around there neither. So they're there. And uh, it's um, that show that uh, my buddy I mentioned, one of the, what they call it, Bobo Zone. They came to Saltville several years ago and did a, a show, one of the episodes there. Picked up some new stories of sightings there around home. And uh, like I say, my book, my first book I've wrote on Bigfoot sightings is chronicling experiences there in uh, southwest Virginia where I live. Got a few stories out of Tennessee and Kentucky and North Carolina. So it's uh, people, we was talking at the uh, uh, round table yesterday, and people asked us, you know, do you think these things are confined to one area? I think they're all over the country. I think about every state in the Union except Hawaii has had sightings. You know, up in Canada and even, uh, you know, all around the world, Every country has a, a, a legend of this, of this type of creature running. You know, over in Himalayas, you've got the Yeti. Uh, even in South Africa, uh, I've got a good friend who works for Elon Musk, believe it or not. Even Musk saw the manuscript of my book. He said, yeah, we have something like this in South Africa. They said they don't get as big as what apparently we have over here, but they've got stories of these critters in South Africa running around. So they're out there. And, uh, you know, they, some people says, oh, I don't believe that. You know, if you if he got up and walked across the stage in front of them, they wouldn't believe it. But there's too many credible sightings, credible people, reliable people have seen something. You know, yeah, I know there's a lot of times if it's a UFO sighting, they get some crackhead or drunk. Oh, hell yeah, I seen it. I was standing over here, you know. Yeah, when I was collecting my stories, some of the stories I collected, I'd just kind of say, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing. So any story I put in my books... I had to get to know the people real well or I already know them for a long time. And I had to truly believe that they believed what they saw. They wasn't just trying to pull my leg or make up a story to get a little attention or anything. So there's, there's a lot of good, reliable information out there. And they're even starting to find some uh, physical evidence now, hair samples and stuff like that. They're running DNA sequencing on. It's not matching up to any known animal we, you know, we've got in the database. So it is out there. Um, like I say, where I live, that people are finally opening up. One of the stories in my book, now, is any of y'all, like I say, this is the farthest north I've ever been, so I'm kind of out of my element here a little bit. Has any of y'all ever been down Smoky Mountains in Tennessee? Ever heard of a place called Pigeon Forge? All right, you know what a crowded mess Pigeon Forge is, right? It's commercialized. It's a fun place to go to, but, brother, it's the thick you can't stir them with a stick down there. Two of my good friends back there several years ago was working for the Hatfield and McCoy Dinner Feud show down there. It's got a huge building as you go into Pigeon Forge. Well, there was a little patch of woods right behind that theater and a creek running through it. And they go out there and skinny dip sometimes on hot days to cool off before they had to go back to the show. Well, one day they went out there and they found some fresh tracks in the sandy bank along that creek there. This is in the middle of one of the crowdest towns in the country. But through there, and people says, well, why, you know, through there, why can't we see them? Any animal or anything that's lived in the woods all its life, it knows how to move. It knows how to use the concealment to get around without you seeing it. It knows how to move with like when the wind blows to cover its sound of moving. So I, you know, I have no doubt that the one guy, like I, said, I know him well. I, in fact, there's pictures in my book of the tracks they took. And uh, the tracks were about two inches deep in that sandy soil. My buddy weighs about 250. His foot track barely made an indent in the sand. So that tells you whatever this creature was, it weighed several hundred pounds probably. They're out there. Uh, I've, I've heard so many good stories since I've been here this weekend. One lady come by and told me that she lives over near where Three Mile Island was in that area. 
said she was driving one day and just had to look down the creek and there stood one at the creek covered with kind of a reddish brownish hair i said did you stop and look she said heck no i didn't stop i sped up she said she was by herself didn't want to get caught in there with that thing but they're out there and i know from what some of the folks i've met here this area here apparently this is a pretty good spot for hunting them too uh what one lady about there she sits about that rock but if y'all get a chance and she don't care check out this rock this lady found it is a fossilized footprint in this rock that's amazing i've never seen the, i've seen dinosaur tracks in rock like that but i've never seen a, a humanoid footprint like that myself so uh that is right i'm tickled to death you bring that out here today to show us um if we had questions yesterday do we think these animals are interdimensional you know some of the new age thought is that these animals are interdimensional they can pass through portals or whatever from here to a, another place another maybe alternate reality or something i don't know for that i'm skeptical of that until i see more proof of it like i say i know what it's like in the woods if you learn the pattern of the woods and stuff you can move now, back before i got hurt uh, i worked construction for years i got hurt several years ago about lost a leg so they put me out to pasture before that i could walk through the woods big as i am i could walk up peck you on the shoulder you would not know i was there until i touched you let you know i was there and because i growing up in the woods i learned how to move how to move through the woods to quietly and you know without being seen i know if i can do it this animal that's lived there for centuries can do it and it, this ain't no new phenomena you know it ain't like when roger patterson took his movie out in california back in the late 60s the native tribes all around our country have stored these animals going back hundreds and even thousands of years some of the tribes considered them a guardian of their of their clan they 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 uh, they respect them they uh they uh they didn't fear them or nothing they, they was considered guardians of their area so they've been around for a long time and even uh, a lot of your um i've read a lot of books now these uh there's a book called The Long Way Home. If y'all may have seen the movie, it's about these uh, these Polish prisoners in World War II got sent to out into Siberia to one of the gulags. They made a movie about it several years ago. They didn't mention this part of it in the movie, but in the book, the guy that wrote it was a Polish cavalry officer. They had escaped the gulag and was walking through Siberia to try to get civilization to get away. And they got way out on the steps there and they spotted two of the, whatever they call the critters over there in Russia. They spotted two of them. They talked about them being really tall, probably eight feet tall. And their arms, their hands reached down almost to their knees. And they could see them, but it was like a couple hundred yards off. But they documented that in this book. I wish they had mentioned it in the movie, but they didn't. So there's uh, they so much out there. If you get back, uh, Daniel Boone talks about an encounter he had with some kind of hairy wild man. Davy Crockett mentions it in one of his stories. Even Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt didn't see it. But one of his hunting guys he hung out with it was i think it's montana was it uh daniel or wyoming i can't remember now but Dan, but teddy roosevelt's hunting guide had stories of running this thing out in the mountains out west so like i say it ain't just a couple of drunks there running around claiming they've seen something there's a lot of credible evidence out there showing that these things are around so i i, I encourage anybody have an open mind at least give it a chance don't just say oh no i don't believe it. i ain't seen it walking down main street i don't believe in it because folks these people out there they wouldn't pay a nickel to see it i ain't need a bale of hay very narrow-minded they think we're the only life in the universe and i don't know what y'all think about that i can't believe it. in all this vast universe and all the planets out there we're the only life now i'm not really willing to say i think et's out there riding around trying to figure out a way to get home but i do think there's other life out there in the universe and i do believe Bigfoot's roaming around these woods out here all around us. That's what I think about it. Is up around the Salmon River in Montana and Idaho where Teddy Roosevelt's uh, guide said he had had an encounter. And that had probably been back around, I'm guessing, 1900 or so, in that, somewhere in that time period. So like I say, they're out there. Has any y'all has any y'all ever had an experience beside this lady with that wonderful rock? Is any of y'all ever, have you seen something or heard something?
Yeah, he helped sell. That, those, the one footprint to my footprint was five. So it was one, two, three. Wow. Wow. What this gentleman was saying for y'all couldn't hear, his wife spot after a snowfall, his wife spotted some footprints in her yard. And he went out and took pictures of them. And it took him five of his steps to cover one pace that these footprints made. That's a good 12, 15 feet right there. That thing was really stepping out there. I've got friends back home that, uh, yes, sir. Really? Wow. The man's telling me now, too, where these footprints, they just stopped at us pointing out in the yard. They didn't circle around. They didn't uh, step back. They just stopped dead in the yard. Now, that might be evidence for the interdimensional travel some people say they can do. Maybe he decided he'd had enough of that snow and he stepped into a warmer climate or something. I don't know. But that is very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Has anybody else here had any sightings or any experience, heard anything? Well, I encourage you, get out there in the woods and listen. Uh, it's it's a it's a fascinating hobby. I mean, I, I've, like I said, I've always been here since I was just a little bitty feller. And I was blessed to see one, like I say, when I was 13 year old. Now, one of, another good story I've got from home, a good friend of mine, they live right next to a cow pasture. And her kids went out to a uh, sleigh ride here a few years ago. And they found these tracks, like this gentleman described, they were really far apart. And when they got up on the mountain, they could see something moving up there, leaning out behind a tree looking at them. There was two of them. There was one really tall one and one small one, a juvenile. And these kids, being kids, even though they was interesting subjects, they didn't make the connection in their head. They were looking at Bigfoot. And uh, when they got ready, they got through sleigh riding. They said, well, we're going home. I said, I don't know where them things went. And the boy said, well, they're standing right there behind that tree looking at us. So they went home, and when her, they told her mom what they seen, they said, what do you think it was, Mom? Mom said, y'all love to read about Bigfoot. Y'all just seen it, and y'all didn't realize what you was looking at. So they run back outside and got pictures of the prints. I've got pictures in my files of those footprints. And uh, the boy, the oldest son, uh, well, as long as he lived there on that, at his home place, he had encounters with them after that. Every now and then he just feel like he needed to get out. He'd walk up in the woods and he said he'd encounter him, maybe up there in the woods where he was at. So th they say something definitely there. It's a fascinating subject. Uh, I've had people tell me that when they saw them, they felt that this thing could read their mind. They just felt it so intense, it's like they was actually looking into their mind and, and uh, reading what they was feeling and stuff. And I, now, like I say, I didn't hang around that long enough. I seem to find out if he could do that or not. But I've had several people tell me that in them stories. So, has anybody got any questions or anything? I know I'm rambling around here trying to tell you a few stories, but has anybody got a question you'd like to ask or uh, anything? Well, folks, I sure do appreciate you coming out here today and putting up with me and not throwing anything at me. Uh, my booth is right over here at this white tent. Anybody like to come by and talk? And love to see your pictures if you get a chance to come by. I appreciate it. And like I say, thank you all very much for sitting there and listening to me today. Let's give it up for Jim. Thank you, Jim.